e-collars are being banned like all over the world prong collars are being banned in a lot of places so some of you who are on the stream don't even have the option of using certain type of training collars it's actually illegal for you to do so now going to petco jumping back over to petco is Petco, and you could probably Google it, they have this whole campaign about we're not using e-collars, we're not selling them anymore because they're cruel. Now, first thing that we have to realize is Petco, PetSmart, who I believe still uses them, these are, still sells them. These are big companies, and they're, believe me, they're concerned about money, not about the dogs, right? Anyone that goes into a Petco and even sees the turtles and the animals and, and anything that you buy there, even the little beta fish, which are just basically like dying in their little jars and no one's taking care of them. And these like starved tortoises that were caught in the wild that look like they're eating the equivalent of children's cereal inside of a bowl. Like you see the most horrid things inside of these places. So then they come up about a campaign about we're not going to sell e-collars anymore because it's cruel. Now, first of all, if you're in the United States or if you're in one of these countries that has Petco's or Pet Smarts, you generally know, first of all, that the e-collars that are sold in these stores, number one, are usually very, very bad quality e-collars that a professional wouldn't use in the first place. You know, usually have horrible settings. Um, they're, they're, they're not good collars and you wouldn't use them because you would be likely using one of their cheap collars to overcorrect the dog or be very hard to to use successfully one of their e-collars um, for anything other than some like really really basic stuff um, the next thing is no one when you step foot inside of one of these stores is generally anywhere qualified to even to even teach or explain to someone how it is used properly and a lot of these stores like petco and pet smart they actually have they sell their own training. Remember, they sell their own training group classes. Generally, now I'm not speaking, I'm sure that in some of these like Pet Smarts or Pet Co's, there may be individuals who work there as a trainer that on their own are better, better in themselves and are and are pretty knowledgeable. But I'm talking as a base, the the requirements for someone who's going to be a trainer in Pet Smart. The last I heard is basically nothing, all right? I once had a good friend of mine who joked that, oh, now I'm a dog trainer like you. I, they, were, they were hiring dog trainers and I applied, I got the job, but no training experience. They gave her a binder and said, basically follow what's in the binder, all right? And that was really the gist of it. So I actually agree when it comes to, them not selling e-collars so that part doesn't bother me i don't think they should i think e-collars should be sold by professionals that know how to use them properly and know you know know when they should be used and could educate someone all right um so that's really part of what's leading to this which is the bigger problem because we're going to talk about collars here and proper use of them um, i want to stress right from the bat you know, right off the get-go is like, I am not for banning any type of collars, but I am for banning um, unqualified individuals from using them, all right? There's a big difference, and that's really what the problem is, and that's where the focus needs to really be. It has to be about we need qualified people um, who understand how to use these tools to teach people how to use them. If it's any type of collar that could potentially harm a dog all right there has to be something focusing on that all right to some degree but not at the individual collars and i'm gonna show you some things why all right because we're talking about proper collar use these are just things that i have now i have a video here i actually removed the i took the video this was just on youtube so this is a video someone's proud of all right i'm not trying to bash this trainer I'm not even going to say the trainer's name. It's just some trainer who's in a country where e-collars and I think even prong collars might be banned. All right. So e-collars, e-collars are banned. All right. And he's training the dog for KNPV. 
All right, now I'll put on the video for a little bit and you see he is basically, the way he's training this dog is far more brutal than anyone needs to train a dog. If they understand animal dog behavior and the concepts of actual training. But if someone does not understand either one of those or even just one of those and not the other, you're going to have stuff that that I think the general public would agree is like, this does not look like how training supposed to be. All right. Now, before I show this video, the result is a dog that there's another video of the dog on the KMPV field, passing with flying colors, everyone applauding. All right. The dog looking beautiful. And a lot of problems with training right now is it's results orientated and not the process orientated. No one looks at, and a lot of things are like that in the dog training world. It's like, okay, this person trained this dog to do these things and won these trophies or these awards or these championships, um, but not how they actually train the dog, all right? Just watch this video for a moment over here, all right? And I, um, let me put this on. Oh, wait, this is the wrong, wrong link I wanted to put on. I got this one, all right? So this is a trainer in a country where it's banned. Now you have to ask yourself, does it matter that they banned e-collars here when you watch the training? And would you want, and in reality, like, does it make sense that you would ban e-collars if the top trainers in the area that are most applauded are basically training like you see in this video, all right? And this is a show-off video. This is a video posted on this trainer's YouTube channel that's basically proud of, all right? So let's just watch some of this. All right, now as we watch this trainer, like I say, you don't, trainers, someone's training the dog, they're, they're just a product of their past experience, all right? This guy, not only does he not have access or he'd be breaking the law to collars where he wouldn't need to use as much force, he probably doesn't even understand concepts like pre-MAC principle and, and the kind of things that could make things easier on a dog like this. Now, these dogs that are being used for KMPV, I showed you videos, videos in other streams. I at least showed you two videos of dogs. One is with like Nate the Dog Man's dog, um, Havoc. And then there was uh, another trainer, um, John, with his dog Bonnie, who come from the same exact bloodlines, same exact area of the world, same genetics as this dog that's being trained, all right? With never ever needing to do anything that looks brutal. This dog looks like it has like, maybe i think maybe a martingale collar on or just a regular buckle collar now training collars when we start looking at the different training collars i'll just let this run as this guy's training as i'm talking about it um is generally you want to use the least amount of force possible so collars some of the scarier looking training collars they're designed so you can use less force less force for equal motivation all right now here he lets the dog bite now these are very very hard dogs right that have been selectively bred really to take a beating and bounce back but these are the same dogs right this is a dutch shepherd that police use and take a beating from the bad guy too and they're going to keep fighting um now training collars before i go to these you know, generally the scarier looking ones, like I said, they're designed so you can use less force for equal motivation. So this trainer, if even with no more knowledge about training, if he was allowed to use a, a um, different types of training collars, you know, or, or, you know, like an e-collar or something like that, they can generally get even with his training plan, whether you disagree with it or not, he would actually use less physical force to get the same amount of motivation on the dog. Therefore, being 
causing less physical damage to the dog when he's when he's doing it all right and this i don't know if he takes the dog i think he takes the dog off and um let's see what happens yeah i think that's it he choke you know it's gonna choke the dog off and it just looks like a regular regular star mark and let's see what happens with the dog here all right not a star mark um he's got like a like a martingale and my my videos kind of pausing up there yeah but it's as you can see, it's it's going to be in general just more more physical force, more restraint. All right, and this is kind of what happens when we start. One of the things that could possibly happen when you're banning a collar, if we're talking about um, a dog with, if we're just dealing with um, uh, an owner that has limited choices and maybe limited limited training. Let's see. Looks like we have some comments over here. Um, where's this coming from? Pack Howell. Um, Oh yeah. Okay. I see you guys. It's, yeah. Leather, leather martingale perhaps. All right. Now, so what's going to happen is in some of these countries, this guy's doing fine. All right. Like no one, no one's going to get no victorious Stillwell or, you know, whatever celebrity dog trainer, um, that's trying to make a buck is going to speak out about that trainer because they're not competing you know, with not competing with PetSmart, they're not competing with anything, you know, it's because they're worried about the collar and what they're going to sell and the training programs they're going to sell. No one's going to talk about that. All right. And, and rough training, um, or, or training that's more aversive than it needs to be is happening with, it, it doesn't matter, right? People could use anything. All right. They could use their bare hands. They're using regular buckle collars. They're using just regular slip collars, like anything, like all these things that are not banned. Now I'm going to go, cause this is leading into, before we go into all these collars, all these other collars, all right? Um, this right here, this happened just to prove my point. Again, there was an incident, um, in North Carolina, like several years ago, where a trooper, let me see, I'll show the video. Um, Animal abuse or training techniques, the answer to that question cost a state trooper his job. Charles Jones was Let's fired see. after officials saw video of what they decided was mistreatment of his police dog. That video played today in open court as Jones fought to get his job back. Aaron Coleman is live so, with more. Let me see, where's the video? And so this is a police Last officer, I was torn between. another, he basically, um, you know, while he's training the dog, because the dog, I believe, wouldn't release the ball. He basically strings the dog up over a rail, dangles the dog, I believe from its choke collar and starts kicking the dog and then actually leaves the dog there dangling. All right. Let's just watch this a moment. It's not a good quality video. Do. Should I go stop him? Should I, you know, what I do? I didn't know what to do. Let's um, get to the I back. Where's I the video? Right at the time. It shows former trooper Charles Jones repeatedly kicking the legs out from under Rico, a dog he was training. Another video shows him leave Rico hanging upright as he walks away. Then you pull him back up. All right. Now, now before we jump on, you know, this, uh, this trooper, there's, uh, there's more to that story. So basically he lost his job. But then what happened is once he went to court, um, all the officers stood up for him and said, this, he's just doing what he was taught. And this was what he was taught. And the other things they were explaining in court that they do, there's some things that I don't remember. There's a whole list of things. Um, and I could even put up the link because there's actually a Wikipedia page on it. There was all kinds of stuff, you know, like using tasers on the dogs and like all kinds of th things. So what happened is they decided that, oh, since this is normal, since that is the standard, um, oh, you can have your job back. And he even got another dog back. They gave him a Labrador, right? Um, instead of, instead of the, the Malinois, but he actually got his job back and he was able to sue. Now, Something similar like this happened to England several years ago where a dog got hung um, on a choke collar, got kicked in the ribs, its ribs got broken, and it ended up dying. Anyway, after some uproar from the community, um, prong collars and e-collars got banned, police officers got banned from using them, even though they were not involved in the incident. Now, of course, I actually agree that if someone does 
if they're hanging a dog and kicking the dog, they're probably not qualified and you shouldn't give them those tools. But it taught, but this kind of leads to the, you know, shows the point that again, where there's a bigger issue over here that's not going to be addressed by by banning tools. Now, I saw one I saw another when I was following this, I remember there were a bunch of news stories. In one of the, it's not in this video that I posted, but I found one once, I could probably find it, where they then interview another police officer from another department that's saying, oh yeah, that's totally wrong, the guy's being abusive. And he's sitting there, he's being interviewed with his own dog that is rail thin with its ribs sticking out and its whole spine, which then leads to another opposite side of the spectrum right? Where abuse is not just about collars. There are police officers that it's common, depending on the department, literally starve their dog by any standard to make it completely underweight and overly take advantage of using food and training to the point where it's way more than you need. Um, and the dogs are literally like starving, you know, and some of them have really bad consequences. So, I'm sorry I'm kind of like this, I'm not getting right to the question, but this is good background info for you because I did post another link, which it's just good to be knowledgeable about because this is happening. I posted a link. There's a trainer named Justin Rigney who I trained with him like, like literally like 20 long time ago, like well over two decades ago. Um, I used to work someplace with this guy. He knows how to train dogs. He's been doing it a long time. I know him. He's hum I've never known him to be inhumane. Anyone that knows him is like a Facebook friend with him or something. He's always posting videos of happy dogs and he uses e-collar and he uses positive re reinforcement. I've never seen anyone talk anything but good about the guy and the dogs always look really happy. But a lot of, he was a police officer. All right. He was a sheriff in, um, he was a sheriff. I posted the link, uh, over here. He was in Palm beach, um, County, Palm beach County. And he was a canine officer. Let me go over to the screen. So I posted the link to the, to the video, to, um, to photos. And he actually, he was a canine officer. This is one photo that I guess he took. There were others. But if you look at this dog, these were the dogs in the program. Um, it is, this is the dog's spine, like protruding all the way up from like its scapulas, from its shoulders, all the way down, everything protruding, ribs, dogs way, way, way underweight and by any standard being starved. Well, anyway, he brought this up to his supervisors and because it caused, um, because he brought this up and between the, and the pop, because of the politics within the organization, he actually got demoted where he was not able to use canines because he was causing problems. All right. And then he went to court and the police officers brought the dogs to the veterinarian that they have a huge canine program. And their veterinarian is under a contract where they get thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a year to be on call for their police dogs. And their own veterinar veterinarian said, this is okay, this is normal for a dog in training. And because of that, in court, they sided with, uh, with Palm Beach. Um, but I just, and he was out, he's out, he's not allowed to be a canine officer. However, there's officers that are starving dogs and hanging dogs and kicking them with no further training that are actually allowed to train. Justin is using an e-collar and treats. And if you watch his training, the proof is in the pudding, right? And this is the story of a lot of trainers out there, right? Not necessarily, you know, like, um, I'm not only talking about trainers that are necessarily doing everything that I teach, right? There's, there's a lot of trainers that are doing their best to be humanely, that to be as humane as possible and to always learn more. All right. But these are the guys that are getting targeted to take away their tools so they can use less force that they're using more, that they're trying to use in a humane manner. While, um, the qualifications of trainers, especially the ones that do need to use punishment um, in their training plans, um, 
And um, those are the ones that are ended up being affected by there being no regulations or no marketing. All right. So that's my huge tangent. All right. Before I get to these uh, before I get to these questions. But I think I really wanted it to, uh, to address it with you guys. Let me see what you guys are talking about over here. Let me see in Pac Howell. Um, Art says, I strongly doubt the U.S. military trains military working dogs using the barbaric t techniques used by too many police departments um, protruding ribs years ago. To, yeah, I don't I, they're not I'm sure of it. They're not starving their dogs to that to that degree. Ali says, uh, can you make this part of the stream of the stream public? All right. If um, I could make this I could make this part of the stream public. Um, um, if you guys don't mind, all right, because um, this is, you know, this is the private area. So um, I could, I, I will make this, pu I can make this public, just don't send any, um, send any person, you know, uh, you know, if you don't want to write anything, you know, that you might not want to be public inside of the pack howl, you know, while, while I'm doing this, just be advised. But this part, I, you know, I can make, I can make public because it is, it is, it is an issue, right? Um, Ali says yes. All right. Now, um, I'm going to go into some of these collars now because, um, this is a subject to me is like, I think is very important. All right. Um, I've been, I have a video actually on here that we can refer to just to kind of like show like, um, credibility, how passionate I am about like training collars, right? This video that I have here, which I'll go through just to demonstrate some of these collars. This, this training video shows us using at least four different training collars. Um, um, and it's over, I think it's over a decade old. All right. I, I'm using the star mark in there, you know, like a decade ago I'm using in that video, I'm using a halty on a dog. I'm using a no pullness, a pull, a no pull harness on a dog, a prong collar and an e collar. There's, I, show you know we were using it you know even back then and this is after remember we were training for over a decade all right so i i feel like i can speak truthfully about the proper use of these collars all right and i've used them all because i want to know and understand the tools of the trade and which ones are good for what purposes right a lot of the people that have the loudest mouths have no experience or even qualifications to talk about the to talk about the collars and that's what the problem is now in this video um there's i'll i'll put this on right let me see for let's make this big and i'll try to shut the volume off because i'm a blabbering okay good so you could hear me and i think hopefully the 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 video is off just give me a second i gotta check my audio okay it's good all right so i shut off the audio in this video so this was um this particular video here, like this was over 10 years ago. And in this video, um, I was explaining foundation style training, but in this video, you can see, I think it's a good example is we have Nate who is using a no pull harness, right? On a bulldog. And then there's Earl. Um, he has a halty on Dawson, right? That was a dog named Dawson. Now Dawson came Dawson came from um, from uh, the Westchester SPCA S SPCA ASPCA. Ugh, am I saying I'm not even saying it right? He was I got him because someone there said they couldn't adopt him that he had too many aggression issues. All right, he was, and when I got him, they had a volunteer trainer that was working him on a choke collar. Right, he was trained on a choke collar. When I brought him to my kennel, if I even put a regular buckle collar on him, he would collapse. His trachea was so damaged, his whole neck re region, from someone using a choke collar on the dog and not knowing how to use it, or maybe it was a slip collar, I could never put him on a regular normal buckle collar ever because if he pulled on it at all, he would get his legs would get wobbly. And he would get no blood coming to his head and he would collapse. So I had to use a collar other than a regular buckle collar on him. All right. And in this video, he has a halty on right now. 
he has it on, but I want to show you some of these packages. All right. There's, there's different types. There's a gentle leader. Listen to it. Gentle leader. There's halty and places. I'm sure Petco PetSmart is going to sell these and just the name gentle leader. And it says these things like on this packages, it says like, um, stops pulling, simplifies training. Um, on that one, um, what else does it say? Stops. All right. Immediate gentle leader, immediate gentle control. All right. Immediate. So we're not even promoting training here. It's like, put this on. You have immediate control over the dog, immediate gentle control, um, painless, never chokes. All right. We want to be clear. Marketing hides the fact that it's still punishment. All right. These collars still they work by causing discomfort. The dog pulls, of course, it's going to, with some dogs, they're going to get some kind of results from it right away because it's, it's meant to make their no, the muzzle uncomfortable and turn their neck, which could possibly, if someone doesn't know what they're doing, cause damage, especially with the lunging dog. Okay. Now, however, if we talk about these collars are great if someone actually trains their dog first to understand what they want from them and what heal is using positive reinforcement and positive methods. So the dog understands what it is first. And then if they understand how to handle the leash, they understand the dog, they use this properly. I use training videos. I would never just hear immediate control from the dog is then yes, it is actually a very good tool for someone with a strong dog, which I've used it, which I've used it with a lot of clients, you know, and I would generally give them choices, but in no way should you be throwing any of these on a dog, right? If not, you can potentially get issues. You can get injuries. You can stress the dog out, all kinds of problems, no different than any other training collar that's used to discourage a behavior if it's just put on immediately by someone that doesn't know what they're doing okay um let me go back here i just want to check to see if you guys are or okay I'll, um there's any questions over here all right so they're moving around what do we got super important topic okay good um so so what we have we'll go back over to this video all right so that is that. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is, um, is the no pull harness. All right. This is true story about the no pull harness. All right. As you can see, it worked good for this bulldog. All right. Um, the dog doesn't have much of a muzzle. Those halty collars are not much of a choice, you know, not going to be, is really not an option for a dog like that. So they're, you know, so, so, you know, so there's other options, you know, now we're looking at like prong collars. Uh, there's these no pull harnesses. There's, there, there's, there's different choices on this particular dog. I used a no pull harness, right? And it obviously works, but it's working because, um, it is a punishment device. All right. Like you gotta, these things, you put it on the dog, right? And it's hooked to the front. And if you look at these, they actually constrict they tighten the front of their mouth and it puts the front of their mouth the front of their chest and it puts pressure under their armpits and actually pulls one of their legs and throws off their center of gravity um it's it's used to cause discomfort to discourage a behavior all right it is positive punishment negative reinforcement so if someone says no we don't train with with discomfort or punishment or anything these it's this is equal. It's just in a different form. Now, this is the other thing about it. All right. And again, I'm not talking bad about this. I've used these. If someone knows what they're doing, they know how to train the dog to the behavior first and don't just use this as a quick fix it, just like any other training collar. All right. It can be, it can be a good training device. However, I must say I myself was seduced by this when it first came out. I was like, Oh, it's like, okay, this looks like if someone is impatient and they need a quick fix, you can give them one of these 
and it could at least hold them over if they have a bad pulling problem until they do further training. The only time in my career that I was basically cursed out by someone in one of my classes was in a puppy class. Someone, I made sure they were teaching their dog how to heal using positive reinforcement first before I would let them go to the classes where we used things like prong collars. And they said, please, 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 my puppy pulls so bad. I was like, well, I do have the no pull harness. This is probably the safest thing, all right, if you just want to reduce the pulling until you get to that class. Anyway, I gave her one of these, same exact ones, all right, the easy walk. I gave her an easy walk. And the next week she came back pissed off, cursing me out because I didn't tell her that this can cause chafing. Her dog was all sore because she put it on the dog, took the dog for a long walk. The dog did not know how to really heal or have any commands. It was, was, was too much rubbing on the dog and the dog had this bad chafing and infection like underneath its arms, all right? Last time I ever did that, I learned my lesson. I was like, oh, it is on equal ground of all the other training collars. I'm not going to use this with any, just like any other collar, unless the person is qualified how to use them. And that was my first experience with that. And I can say this is the one I started using least. All right. Now, I'm sure there's models that help with the chafing, but it's no different from when you see prong collars that have like rubber tips on it and stuff like that. All right. You could try to do things to make it less likely to get injured, but it's still not gonna work the best way and it's gonna cause more stress than necessary unless someone knows how to actually, knows how to actually use it, all right? Now, um, let's see, we got some, some chat, chat, chat. Um, is, yeah, I agree, Dave. Yeah, definitely what's needed more than anything else is awareness of and proper use and some sort of standards, all right? Yeah, for e-collar manufacturers or, or for anyone, all right? Um, there's definitely the, so there's definitely a need for like some sort of standards, of course, with the tools to make them safe, but also when we're actually using them, all right? Now, I've discussed in the past, right, Lima, right? So I'm all for Lima and, and, and some people that use punishment um, are going to be scared of that word. All right. But that's the trainer's best friend. That's really what the key should be. That's really the key to standardization and how to use collars, which actually gives people a lot of freedom to training ways they want, as long as they sort of pay attention to some fundamentals, right? Which is if, especially for a professional, right? If someone hires you and they trust you, they want to make sure you want to get them results, but you want to make sure that you're just not going to cut corners for the sake of cutting corners. There's an actual dog there, right? And you're hired to make the dog's life better as long as the person, as well as the person, right? You can't just do one or the other, right? Um, and, and if someone trains with that in mind, where they're going to use the least aversion, teach the dog everything it can without it, right? Um, then use punishment to help the dog, all right? And it's without a doubt, if you go to anyone who's qualified to speak on the subject, all right? I'll refer to um, Stephen Lindsay's um, books, all right? Volumes on training. The only volumes that are recommended by like every major dog training um, or organization that I know of, um, it, it clearly states that you really cannot do any type of like, um, any type of good training with dogs, of course, across the board, reliable training without the proper use of punishment. All right. You can do a lot of stuff with positive reinforcement. It is super important part of the plan, but it's just irresponsible. It's even negligent. I would say to tell someone that I can train your dog, um, to some type of reliability completely without using punishment. All right. It's like, it is it is impossible unless you're in a very, very controlled situation. So we need to know how to use these things properly. All right. Now I'm going to move on to some, to some more collars here. Right. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go back over here to the stream. All right. And, um, uh, let's see, let's blow this back up. All right. Now see, I'm going to jump ahead over here. Um, now these collars, all right, the halties, to answer, going back to answer Shrog's questions, all right? 
these collars can be used on these two types of collars can be used on any size dog all right um and it's mostly using you know leverage to basically cause this you know discomfort on on the dog i would say the halty is the most aversive you know the head halter types are the most aversive and potentially the most dangerous because we're dealing with the dealing with the neck region if someone doesn't know what they're doing but however used properly you can most easily control like the larger the larger dogs with it but i would say it is one of the highest risk of injury from for sure the um those no pull harnesses um for sure they definitely work, but high risk for chafing, you know, and, and things going on underneath the armpits. You got to really make sure that they're sized properly. Um, there's just a lot of room for error with those, but they do work if someone's looking for somewhat quicker results that is not going to have people that you have to, where you don't have to like answer a lot of questions. Like, what is that that you have on your dog? Are you being abusive? Stuff like that. All right. But with the no pull harnesses, it's very limited with other training, you know, teaching the dogs to do things like sits and downs and stuff like that. Um, um, but it is what it is. All right. Now I'm going to jump ahead here. I think probably at about in a minute we have, um, I'll go, let's go about here. Um, we have, yeah, Earl is putting on a prong collar. All right. So I got the prong collar here. All right. Now prong collar, if you watch, you put it on the dog. Now you got to remember, these dogs were trained with positive reinforcement first. And they even have treat bags on them still, Nate and Earl, in that video. So when the dogs are trained with punishment, all right, um, they never stop doing positive reinforcement training. It the, the punishment part just gets stacked upon it. So he's still getting the benefits of the positive reinforcement. All the dogs in this video are on a thinned out variable reward schedule, which means they're still going to get treats. They're still going to get rewards. They're still going to get love. They're going to get toys. They're going to get positive things, but it's the trainer's job to thin it out to a degree where they still get the motivation from the dog. But the owner of these dogs, when they take the dogs, does not have to carry around a suitcase full of treats, which the dog, if you're given too much treats after a while, they're not going to be hungry anymore anyway. Right. Um, but with a prong collar, oh, and there he's using a star mark collar, right? This is before they were even called star mark collars. They were called like good dog collars back then. This is over 10 years ago. Um, he's showing, you know, these are when these first started kind of coming on, coming on the market, right? And I'll pause this for a moment, come back to me because I have some of them here, all right? Um, the newer ones are usually easier to put on. Now, these, all right? These are one of my go-tos like for a pretty safe collar for almost any dog because um, to start training, although it's usually not a finish, a finishing collar for a lot of dogs because it's very, very mild. Some people could see prongs on it and say, oh, that's scary. It's plastic. But what happens when it's used properly, it actually evenly distributes the pressure of the leash around the dog's neck, similar to the metal prong collars, which, which I'll show next, which makes it safer on the dog's neck. So this I was a, I'm able to use with dogs with collapsed tracheas, like the dog Dawson in the video that I said would collapse. He'd be on a star mark, pro no problem, because the pressure is going evenly around his neck, and it's just the tips that are gripping around the neck. He would not collapse, all right? So these are really good for teaching the dog the concept of moving, you know, when you want them, you know, when you're teaching them, um, when you're teaching them punishment, right? Which is not a bad word. Punishment just equals discouragement, all right? Um, you're discouraging behaviors. And it's not to be confused with abuse, right? Which, which even reward training, as I was talking about with those police officers that are starving their dogs can be abused. Abuse is just misusing or overusing anything. All right. So any of those collars can be overused like the no pull harness, cause chafing. Um, you can these things, you can jerk this really hard and overuse it. None of the trainers that are that know how to use these things properly are going to do anything that would they would not be embarrassed to do in public. Nothing that's going to look like hard pulls on the dog. All right. It's going to be too long to go over the proper use of every single little detail. 
but but generally these the way some trainers right use them with pressure release the way that i'm generally teaching if you're following this site is mostly pumps right where we just learn to do like little little nudges with them basically to get the dog to move into the um to, to fix the position that they're in and then it's getting followed through with reward right so when it's used minimally in lima meaning we taught it everything we can with positive reinforcement this the minimum amount of force the least amount that we have to to basically help the dog get on track so they're getting rewarded and praised all right it's it's not going to revolve around this and then you have the prong collars i have another like little prong collar this is basically um a metal version which has been around longer these get a lot of bad slack because they're they look like torture devices and some trainers do use them like torture devices because there's no regulations and double fist jerk them where even these if you see a trainer who is on the top who is really like trying to be a better trainer is learning more is going is is you know is is learning from seminars taking online courses going to different schools any trainer who's qualified nowadays there's no reason for anyone to be jerking this thing hard trainers are generally either doing pressure and i could i could probably pull this so hard i'm gonna break the prong collar before i injure my arm all right with this one right here all right is because it's going evenly around my neck i mean around my arm all right so People either doing pressure release or they're doing pumps like the way I teach on this site. And that's the way these things are supposed to be used. All right. Correctly. And with this, it is less force than the trainer you see in that video, you know, from the European country. You can do more with the dog with something that actually has that you can do more discomfort with less force. All right. Less physical harm to the dog. That's all is it for. All right. All, any trainer who's training full time, they pretty much got into it because they like animals. They're not going to, they definitely don't want to deal with the headache of having to explain themselves. All right. Um, explaining themselves for something that doesn't work, you know, that's not more humane to the dog when they're, when they're training it the right way. That brings me to, I'll show you another same, same concept, right? I showed this before on streams. All right. This is the canine precision collar, right? The canine precision collar, which I've been playing around with this. Now this, this is, um, this was actually one of the reasons why this was made is because Mitch, the trainer who invented this, this design, he too, he, he didn't want the trainers to have to deal with people like answering questions about like, oh, aren't you being abusive? So he made it. So that you can't even see the prongs that are inside of here. You know, then he uses something on this collar. If you look at it, I don't know if it's going to focus that good. It looks like spikes. All right. Now, this is the kind of thing a Petco or something would love to jump all over. All right. Like if they find that this was a threat to whatever they're selling in their store and they're training, they'll be like, oh, look, look how mean this looks. But in reality, all right. Um, over canine healing where where Mitch invent where Mitch has been using these because he's actually a professional trainer that trains the dogs with rewards first and then he's using this humanely he's not taking this and jerking around the dog he actually has the reason why there's so many scary teeth is actually to have more surface area so it's less force on the dog and it's the same idea as the other collar, all right? It's like once you have a lot of surface area, it is safer. It's more points, not flat. It's actually safer for the dog's neck, and it could just be used in pumps. He just he uses it in pumps for the dog, all right? He just uses it on the pumps, and all of his clients that are not brainwashed, you know, that are just introduced to it in a humane way by a friendly trainer who cares about their dogs, they all love it, you know, because it brings us to the second part of Lima, all right? Lima is, there's the least aversive part, all right? Minimally aversive, that's the second half, all right? Minimally aversive. We always try to be minimally aversive. Don't do anything harder than you have to. The first part of Lima is least intrusive, 
all right? And that's also important. That means least intrusive to the relationship between the dog and the owner, all right? So when someone uses a training device, humanely, with least aversion, and they're also paying attention to allowing the dog to have more freedom, go on more walks, that's the least intrusive part, all right, to the relationship. So if someone is not gonna use a training collar because they're against it, but they're, they cannot get the dog trained because they're doing things that are so limited, they can't bring the dog certain places. Now we're talking about more intrusive to the relationship where the dog is in the kennel more, it cannot be out. It's, you know, it's now we're talking, it's more intrusive, right? So professional trainers are always looking to improve the relationship and improve the life of the owner and the dog. And then it should stick out and be obvious when that's not happening, right? Generally, if someone sees training and it looks abusive to 90% of people that are watching it, all right, it's probably not good training, all right? Generally, good trainers, they don't have to edit videos, they don't have to do anything behind closed doors. Um, they can do it out in the open and you're not gonna see anything scary going on. Let me see, I heard some chimes coming in. I just wanna... Um, see if I'm missing anything over here um, is um, let's see okay there's some stuff here okay I'll go back over here um, to our video now I want to go go to the next thing all right so like I say the the canine precision pros and cons to this right before pros is it actually, in public, it actually looks really good. You don't have to deal with misinformed people like saying anything because you actually can't even see that, all right? The con is the same con as every other dog, every other equipment. If someone didn't know what they were doing and just took this and thought it was going to fix their dog, just like any other collar, there could be more, to, more pulling on this than necessary and anything any piece of training equipment doing too much pressure for too long is going to cause irritation or injury, right? But if a dog is trained the right way and it's minimal and we're looking for a loose leash and everything, it's actually very, very gentle with the dog, all right? And you can find videos of gentle leaders, halties, and new pole harnesses all embedded in dogs, cores and sores, and people leaving them on, all right? But otherwise, it's like, oh, and of course, with this one, talk about training collars is this is easier to come on and it's not you can, it's easier to put on it doesn't fall apart like a prong collar or um or a star mark collar right so these are these collars now the other doozy that we got to talk about is um that we got to talk about is the e-collar right um and the e-collar the one that everyone's after is um let's see i'll go to Actually, Earl, yeah, Earl's going to walk around with this dog on the e-collar, all right? So this dog is doing e-collar. And if you can watch the dog, the e-collar is, you know, this dog is trained on e-collar properly, right? By trainers that trained the dog to heel. That's called the heel, where we want the dog following at your heel, a traditional heel to be more exact, right? Where not a competitive one. We want the dog following at the heel so it's easier to make turns or not tripping on the dog, all right? Now, this dog was not trained with an e-collar how to heel. The dog was trained with reward how to heel and to enjoy healing, all right? Then the dog learned on, on a collar. I don't remember what type. It wouldn't have mattered if it was a precision collar, a prong collar, a star mark collar. The dog learned very gently, once it understood the position, that when you get out of position, you're going to very mildly feel discomfort as we help you cor correct you, right? Correct. Think of correcting a test for like a kid in school. You're giving them the right answer, right? So a correction also helps bring the dog in the right position, corrects them, where then it could get more and quicker rewards and be happy, all right? That's what these collars were used for. Then... The dog was trained on the e-collar because since it did all of its learning through positive reinforcement, then gently with these collars that go on the leash, that go that 
that go that connect to a leash where you can show the dog direction, not using a lot of force because fortunately these are not banned in my area. The dog was then able to learn when punishment happens and how to avoid it. Very, very gentle, which then means when we got to the e-collar, which I don't have an e-collar on my table right now, literally all this dog needed at that point. So we're talking about Lima, all right? Least amount of aversion possible is literally we were using collars that have 127 levels, which means a Petco collar that they ban might have maybe 10 levels where one, the dog doesn't feel. Number two, the dog cries, all right? A prof good professional collar, we use the dog tras. You can adjust it right to the point where the dog just feels it enough where they care enough about it, where they'd rather it go away. Not enough to make them cry. It would actually be counterproductive to have a panicking, crying dog, all right? But our job as trainers is to teach the dog, all right? And that's why people hire professionals. They hire professionals to do things that that if they did it on their own, they can cause problems or bad side effects. That's why people hire plumbers to work with the pipes so they don't blow up their own house, all right? They, they work with people who are qualified, all right? There's certain things you're not gonna try to do on your own car maybe, all right? Or you're gonna end up getting yourself killed, all right? And there's all kinds of analogies. That doesn't really exist for trainers, right? Where there's any type of regulation, all right? Like anyone call themselves a trainer. They learned how to use one tool, learned how to do it in a couple of weeks, they purchased a franchise or something and they're going to just do it. They're going to take an e-collar and just blast away at it. All right. Now, in, in this video where dogs are being trained by professionals, the dogs did all this training before that. And then the e-collar was used minimally amount to train the, to, to replace with Nick. In, in this style, it is simply a microsecond Nick to replace when it would have got pumped with the leash to help. It gets layered and then we wait till the dog understands just on the collar, just on understands on the e-collar. Now this is important about the e-collar because some people might watch this video and be like, well, um, you don't need, you know, why won't you just use treats, all right, or whatever for off-leash training, right? We're talking about off-leash training here. Now this is important. All right, trainers, a good trainer that uses an e-collar does use treats, all right? But just like a gas pedal and a brake are two different, have two different purposes in the car, all right? One means to go, keep doing what you're doing, car, go forward. The other one means stop car, I'm about to go off a cliff. It's the same thing. You cannot replace, you cannot replace um, rewards. You cannot, you cannot replace punishment with a reward. All right. Um, all right. It's just, you cannot really, you cannot really do it. We're teaching the new behaviors with the, that we want first with the rewards we're encouraging. And then we want to discourage the behaviors that could potentially be deadly, even deadly to the dog. When we're talking about working dogs and dogs that are off leash, dogs that are aggressive. All right. Um, and it's backed by science. Like it's 100 percent backed by science and there's nothing there's no science anywhere that says punishment used the right way at the right time is abusive all right it's like saying let's take the halters off of all horses and just hang a carrot in, in front of them it it'll be like it's 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 a real thing that animals learn right it's part of their life all right and it helps us be lima all right um helps us to be least intrusive minimally aversive, all right? There's things before there were e-collars, the replacement for an e-collar was not food. People have been using food since the beginning of really animal training, they've been using it. The replacement before good e-collars came along, if you look at old books, if someone had to administer punishment from a distance, which people had to, all right? They were generally throwing things at the dog, right? They were either throwing things at the dog or trying to scare the dog or frighten the dog by doing, if they had a naturally skittish dog, they were probably using loud noises or banging pots together or they were doing things, all right? And people that are against e-collars um, say, oh, we, you're training with fear and pain, all right? No, we don't want to train with fear or pain, all right? You had, it was... More, it was easier to hurt a dog if you were throwing things at them, 
all right? And that's the way it was done in the past. If you look at history, right? If you had a dog that did not come and it was not selectively bred by a breeder that made naturally very biddable dogs, all right? Because a lot of people that are vocal, they're they're basing things off of their own experience, like with their with their border collie that came from generations and generations of dogs that were very good at taking orders, all right? And they do not they don't necessarily have to pick up the phone and train dogs from the people that have the hardest dogs that are in shelters that were already rehomed because they're the least biddable naturally dogs. They're, it's proving it's science. There's 20 years of science in Jackson laboratories. All right. That that was that was done. The Scott and Fuller studies that proved different dogs have different temperaments. Different dogs have, you know, different breeds have tendencies for, diff, you know, to do different things. Individual dogs have tendencies to have different temperaments. There's temperament tests that 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 it's it's it doesn't it's it's right in front of your face. You just have to look. Dogs have different temperaments and some are harder to train than others. And you cannot do the same thing for all of them. All right. Now, an e-collar in the past, I, I, I was actually talking about this once when I had Darcy in the room. All right. I had Darcy in the room and um, Darcy is a hyperactive dog. All right. She's hyperactive dog. Her Volar test, if you know what the Volar puppy test is, she's very, very not a biddable dog. Right. And she's very hyperactive. I co-owned her with the breeder. Even the breeder, after putting all this investment into her, said she's naturally not very biddable, you know, um, kind of hyperactive, high prey drive, all these things. I don't want to use her in my breeding program so you can have her. So now she's all mine. But because she is harder, I used to not be able to have her. Now she's out playing with the other dog in the room while I was streaming because she would she would pace if she still had too much energy in her. Sometimes even when you got all the energy out of here and she would go underneath the table and she would rip she would trip up on all the wires, right? There's something potentially dangerous to her, all right? So I had two choices. I could lock her out of the room where she didn't get to be with me or I could put her in a kennel and be like, oh, well, it's like we're just going to manage the situation. Or I put a scat mat under the desk with nine volt battery. She went underneath there. One little static thing. She didn't even cry, but it was uncomfortable. It's an electric device, which some people would say shock, where she was like, okay, that was uncomfortable underneath the desk. And then for hours, she's in the rest of the room laying down underneath the desk. That's Lima in the works, all right? That is, yes, I'm going to use the least amount of aversion, but I'm not, I'm also paying attention to the intrusiveness of our relationship, all right? The dogs, they go outside in the yard and they dig through something and there might be something sharp or something like that and they stay away from it, all right? Um, training used thoughtfully, minimally amount, minimum amount that allows a dog to have more freedom and a better relationship, all right, with no long term like side effects is helping the dogs in a lot of places, right? It helps them um, be free with the owners more in the house. It allows them to be in the yard, all right? Things like invisible fences and stuff like that, all right? Like some people, because of where they're renting or where they live, they cannot have a physical fence. And then they train the dog on an invisible fence. If it's done the right way, the dog only gets a couple of corrections with an, you know, with, with, a uh, with, a uh, you know, with an electric collar. And those usually are higher levels, all right? And, but the thing is, it is, we're talking about the real world, right? With the e-collars. And because of that, the dog actually learned a real life lesson that, yeah, outside of that boundary is dangerous. All right. And we didn't lie to the dog. All right. Except we did something that's not going to kill the dog and the dog can recover from. And if it's taught the right way, the dog 100% understands where it happened and why it happened. Right. But then that dog spends a lifetime in the yard with the family. All right. This is just one of the many, many examples. Right. As opposed to the dog being locked in the house in a kennel or even being rehomed because the owners now don't have enough time for the dog. The dog's hyperactive in the house because it doesn't get to run around in the yard. All right. So, um, that is, and there's, I could go on and on and on about other collars, right? There's like slip loops and things like this, which I think these are like the last things that are ever going to be banned, right? Um, because they don't look that scary, but these are potentially, um, most modern trainers stay away from these for training purposes um, because everything, everything else I mentioned here 
with the exception of probably the halty collar, which can be very dangerous, is safer, you know, than using this, which is potentially a lot of force constricting, right, on on the trachea and some of the major major blood vessels. If we're using it to control a dog that um, um, that is, you know, more hyperactive or or, so, or something like that. All right. So I hope that's my little rant on the on on the collars over there. Um, and what's going on with Petco. So I, I did get I did get sidetracked, but let me go see what you guys are saying and let me get to your guys, uh, you know, videos um, and, and other questions. All right. So let's see. So that was that was a rant. That was about an hour rant on the on the on the first on the first question there. But to answer the question quickly, okay, can you please talk about the different types of collars? All right, I, I did that and how to use them properly and what's the best for what size dogs. All right, all of them, um, and you know, pretty much any of them, Shirag, right? They're used properly by doing positive, re make with any of them, you gotta do the phase one training first. You gotta do the positive reinforcement training, teach with rewards, then teach them how to be, you know, you correct with the collars, but they need to know what's right first before you show them what's wrong. And most of the training collars, like I said, mostly done by pumps. And you could watch the Leash Ninja video to get an idea of it, or, you can definitely, if you go to these videos over over here, um, if you go into the foundation style dog training course over here and you go into like the intro to phase two, this will definitely give you a good idea of, of um, how to use really any of the collars because it's very interchangeable. But I would go over here. I would go to intro to phase two and I think this would answer will give you a little bit more details than what I did right there with just that, just that intro. Um, 